Premier Doug Ford called for a, quote, iron ring of protection around Ontario's long-term care homes. So far, it has not stopped the devastation. Staff, residents, some of the most vulnerable people in our communities are sick and too many have died. Will the so-called SWAT teams and other measures announced yesterday help? Let's ask our guests, all of whom are in the provincial capital. Dr. Samir Sinha, Director of Geriatrics at Sinai Health System and the University Health Network. Donna Duncan, she's the CEO of the Ontario Long-Term Care Association. And Charlene Stewart is here. She's president of the SEIU Healthcare Union. That's the Service Employees International, which represents more than 60,000 frontline workers. And we are pleased to have all of you here for a very timely conversation about what many are referring to as ground zero in our war against COVID-19. Dr. Sinha, let me start with you. Uh, apparently, nearly half the deaths in Canada from COVID-19 have been linked to long-term care homes. How did it come to this? It's a real sad story, Steve. Um, it's actually the majority of the deaths have actually been in Canada's long-term care homes. And currently we have over a thousand homes across the country, principally in BC, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec that are now in outbreak. Um, and we're realizing that it's a combination of two things. One is that A, we've you know, this is where this long-term care and retirement homes are where we house some of our most vulnerable people who um, who are most at risk of getting this, especially when they live in close quarters and often do things communally and receive care from many of the same people. But the other challenge is, is that systemic vulnerabilities, the way we've often staffed these homes, allowing people to work uh, between multiple homes, um, the fact that uh, we don't have enough of the right equipment or the training um, in place, all these things kind of allowed um, COVID-19 to get into homes. And unfortunately, it's still spreading at the moment. And so this is why we've been calling for our governments uh, to take action to really focus more attention on this front line now. Donna, from your point of view, what's contributed to this? I, I, I agree with uh, some of Samir's comments. We, we had a perfect storm before we went into this. Uh, we had a, a severe and critical uh, staffing shortage. Uh, we had old buildings uh, that hadn't been replaced. There was a reason why the government committed to uh, redeveloping all of our homes. Uh, homes with four bed wards are not optimal for isolation and infection control. And then we had precarious funding and, uh, you know, under-resourced, uh, understaffed and uh, poorly built homes. Charlene, what would you add? Uh, both of them are absolutely right. I mean, we we were in a crisis before the pandemic hit, and the pandemic has just shone a magnifying glass on the problem. But it is a staffing issue uh, that we don't have enough staff there, and it's getting worse. Like we we are now experiencing, and we're experiencing uh, critical uh, retention and recruitment problems, and this has just uh, made it severe. Uh, I don't want to come off like a Monday morning quarterback here, but I suspect people do want to know sort of where the buck stops. So, uh, Dr. Sinha, why don't we start with you. In terms of accountability, like who's, who's the last line of defense here that it ought to be responsible for things not getting to this point? Well, I think the, the I think when people think about long term care, be it home care all the way to um, care in nursing homes across our country, people have to remember that these things were never part of the Canada Health Act. So it's not the federal minister of health. It's not the federal minister of seniors or the public health agency of Canada. It's actually provincial and territorial responsibility. And that's why we see in every province and territory respond differently to the sector and support the sector differently. But the fundamental commonality that you heard from my colleagues was that all long-term care and retirement homes were having challenges, you know, with their staffing issues before this actually hit. And partly that was because most people couldn't actually get full-time work with pay like full you know reasonable pay and benefits in these environments they'd be a part they'd be employed on a part-time basis so what would you do you'd work multiple homes and when you don't get sick days in many cases what would you do you'd come to work and try and work through that illness and that is these are some of those systemic vulnerabilities that we've known ever since we had the SARS commission before that pointed out these were problems there they never really got dealt with and now we're seeing that these are some of the systemic issues that need to be dealt with, and it has to be dealt with at each provincial and territorial ministry. Hmm. Donna Duncan, for those who are going to look at this problem and say, look at you guys own most of these homes, uh, you know, this is your problem, you should have been solving this every step of the way, how would you respond to that? 
you know, I, I, I don't think it's the time right now to, to worry about uh, FedProv relations. I, I think we need to shore up our homes right now. Certainly what we've been asking for consistently is uh, give us the resources to hire more staff, let us compensate our staff appropriately, let us rebuild our buildings. Uh, and, and we are a creature of government, a uh, highly prescribed legislative uh, and, and compliance regime that, that guides us. Uh, we take our direction from the province, as, as Samir noted, uh, as well as uh, give us the tools to recruit. Let's change the culture in these homes. Uh, let's destigmatize long-term care. There's a reason why people don't want to work in long-term care. It's very, very heavy work. Uh, I don't believe that there was a clear understanding about who our residents are and what their care needs are. How do we staff them properly? How do we fund the system properly to, to, to get those staff? Uh, so this is a big wake up call right now and uh, you know till now I, I don't think people really really realized and even as we're looking at the response today uh, we were calling for help uh, long before this. Hmm. Charlene Stewart, do you think people, the people you represent, do you think they feel stigmatized for working in this sector? You know, they are very, very special people. Uh, to take care of uh, seniors, they, they, they build a relationship with them. They're like their family. So mm -hmm. I, I, that's the type of uh, uh, view that I have on these workers. Uh, you know, they're like family. And right now, uh, they will put their residents before themselves, 90, 90, 95% of these workers are women. So again, you know, they, they uh, will put those loved ones ahead of anything else that they do. So, uh, you know, the problem is the stigmatism is one thing, but it's a systemic problem. Uh, you know, these owners are for-profit homes and uh, they need to be putting some of the profit in the front line too. Uh, that's been some of our ask. They come into the province and they, uh, you know, start up homes, which again, with the uh, senior population growing, there's a, you know, a, a real need for these homes. And they have to also do their share. Uh, the cuts that have happened in this sector have contributed to the crisis that we're in now as well. Hmm. Okay, uh, Donna Duncan, I should let you comment on that if you want to. Uh, it, you know, I as we're monitoring the situation, we're, we're looking at what the governance looks like in the homes and how homes are responding across the province. Um, you, you know, the uh, unfortunately, the data are, are neutral to governance right now. Uh, you know, homes are... Uh, it, this is about the population we're serving. It's about our capital plant, uh, physical plant in the homes. Uh, certainly, we need to look at what our funding models look like going forward, what our care models look like, right? But most importantly, right now, our priority has to be getting people into long-term care today. We need to marshal an army over the, the next five days uh, and focus on, on care and support. And I, I do echo Charlene's uh, comments. Our, our frontline staff are heroes, absolute heroes. The courage that they have displayed in stepping up, especially in these homes with large outbreaks, is just truly remarkable. We're going to talk more about that in a second, but I, I first want to get Samir Sinha to give us a sense as you look across the country of how well or poorly Ontario's long-term care home situation currently is, uh, say, compared to other jurisdictions, including, I guess, most, uh, most importantly, right next door in Quebec. How are we doing compared to everybody else? Well, um, I'd say we're kind of in the middle, we're in the middle position right now. So BC, where we had our first outbreaks in the country, they now have uh, stabilized the situation by taking some decisive actions with their staffing and other things, a little bit ahead of what Ontario and other places have done. And so they actually have, they're sitting about less than 10% of their homes right now are currently in outbreak. Um, where, you know, you go to Quebec at the other end, over 50% of their homes now are actually in outbreak um, to the point where we were seeing in some dire situations like Residence Eron in, uh, in Montreal, we were seeing how the uh, minister eventually just said we need to actually just redeploy hospital um, resources to try and stabilize things there um, and actually just try and test everybody in long-term care, um, including, um, including staff. Ontario right now, um, from the numbers that my team is collecting through the National Institute on Aging, um, right now there's a gross underreporting of numbers. Right now, officially, you know, they're reporting long-term care homes, but they're not mentioning that we actually have more um, retirement homes than we have long-term care homes. And over 10%, about 15% of these homes are now in outbreak across Ontario. Um, despite some of the things that we've been announcing in the past weeks that I've been helping to advise the government to do, um, we're still seeing every day new homes in outbreak 
And it really makes me wonder whether or not, even if we have the good policies in place, how are we implementing these things? How are we ensuring that we have the right staffing? How are we making sure that even people know how to put on per personal protective equipment properly? Because these are the things that you could have all the right, you know, the right uh, ideas out there, but it's actually how they're going to be operationalized, which will tell us how successful we're going to be. Well, you've asked some good questions there. Do you have, do you have answers to those questions? Well, you know, what we do have is we have a lot of data that's been coming out from the United States. So, uh, you know, there was a report just this past weekend that in New York State alone, 2,000 people in their um, their long-term care and retirement homes died. Um, and they're uncovering new grisly situations every day. Um, the CDC has done a really good job. That's the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta actually studying what happened. They've had the time to deploy teams to really understand. And one of the biggest things that I'm concerned about here in Ontario is it's one thing to put in new staff. It's another thing to have different types of PPE made available every day. But what they were seeing was where things really fell apart was when staff were under stress and staff weren't really sure how to put on their PPE well. And so they ended up contaminating themselves. And I can tell you, I just spent an hour this morning at Sinai learning how to properly put on and take off PPE. I had to redo it three times with my nursing leadership there watching over me because, you know, it's not easy things to do. And you can imagine incredibly hardworking, mostly women, you know, at these front lines who are not well paid, who are stressed themselves and worried they're going to get infected. You have all that going through your mind and then you're trying to do the best you can. And this is where I'm worried that if we don't have enough of the right response to the front line, um, we're going to see more outbreaks, we're going to see more deaths, um, and we're not going to give the staff the support they need. Well, the cabinet minister of the Ontario government that's responsible for this file, namely long-term care, is a medical doctor herself. Her name is Marilee Fullerton, and she was made available to reporters yesterday for the first time uh, on this issue. And here is a little snippet of what she had to say. Chad, let's roll that clip, please. We will be launching more aggressive testing, screening and surveillance by screening all symptomatic staff and residents, as well as asymptomatic contacts of confirmed cases. We will be enhancing testing in all homes with a targeted plan for homes in outbreak and testing of asymptomatic residents and staff in select homes across the province. We will be growing our heroic long-term care workforce by deploying hospital and home care resources into homes when needed. Every option is on the table and additional measures will be taken as we address this fast changing outbreak. Marilee Fullerton, the Minister for Long-Term Care. Um, okay, uh, Charlene, let's start. What's your reaction to the announcement made yesterday by the Minister? When I watch those pressers every day, I literally run around this living room. Uh, it is very disappointing to hear some of the stuff that's being said on there because uh, I personally have met with the minister three weeks ago. Uh, we reminded them of the SARS guidelines. I uh, said six weeks ago, what are you going to do about workers working in multiple work sites? Nothing was said, nothing was done. When the redeployment orders came out, I said to Minister Fullerton, you can redeploy these people you know, anywhere right now, but if you don't do something about the staff shortage and particularly start implementing PPE, there's not going to be staff to redeploy. And that's where we are today. And I've got examples of homes that listened to us and said, treat this as asymptomatic from the beginning. Treat it like everybody is infected. And they're now saying that they found this out a couple of weeks ago. That's absolutely not true. So wh how do I feel? Uh, you can tell I get so upset when I watch those things because what they're saying they're just recently finding out, no, they found out weeks ago on this stuff. In which case, why haven't they done anything? What have they told you? Well, the Premier himself said it's because we had a shortage of staff. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> that's been going on for a couple of decades. Like, when did you figure that out? That's the answer. We had a shortage of staff. We knew that was the answer. We also knew seven weeks ago that we did not have adequate PPE in this province. And we asked the government, work with us, work with the unions. These frontline workers are used to being in a crisis and dealing with crisis and figuring it out. They did not communicate from the beginning and they did not keep the frontline uh, at the command tables through their unions. 
So I know people don't want to look backwards, but we have to look backwards. There was big mistakes made, mismanagement, uh, and still it's continuing. The body counts that we're hearing is not accurate. Uh, those homes are keeping stuff away from workers, from families, from public health. No, it's, you know, testing people, you know you can be negative today and positive tomorrow. You have to get the proper uh, personal protective equipment in there. And masks aren't doing it. Like the doctor said, we need N95s. And again, I call on those corporations that are making money off of this business to find those and put them into their own homes. Donna, your reaction to the minister's uh, uptick in announcement yesterday? You know, it's 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 urgent. It's needed. Uh, as I said, we have to mobilize an army right now. I, I absolutely agree that we we will not have staff if we do not have personal protective equipment. If we don't have shields, masks, gowns, gloves, those are those are the weapons against this uh, this war that we're fighting. Uh, certainly, uh, we we need people in, and I think to uh, Samira's point, uh, marshalling in uh, teams, SWAT teams, uh, they're calling them from hospitals and public health to uh, help with donning and doffing the garbs, uh, training them to make sure that, that it's being done properly, uh, uh, enhancing our staffing levels to allow for uh, better infection control, more direct care, dealing with the critical illness. This is what we have to deal with today. Uh, we are going to have to step back and look at what what worked and what didn't work and I think most importantly what didn't work over the last number of weeks uh, in terms of the response uh, but right now the next five days are crucial the next two weeks are going to be pivotal in this uh, and uh, we need to do whatever it takes and uh, rally the troops but there will be none if they don't have the, the benefit of that PPE and those tests are important in my mind psychologically as much as anything to, just to know in a moment uh, either you have a negative test or a positive test. And yes, people talk about the science of false negatives, but, but information is something that people can work with. And I think to Charlene's point as well, we need to know what supplies there are, where they are, when are they coming. It's great that they're saying that they're prioritizing long-term care, but we need to see that. We need to see it happening. We need to make sure that our homes have, have what they need. And right now the uh, supply chain is managed by the federal government and the province. It's not managed by the homes. Samir, I did go on Twitter yesterday after Minister Fullerton's announcement, and I noticed there was a tweet from the former Minister of Health, Tony Clement, who was the Minister of Health in Ontario during SARS 17 years ago. And his response was, I thought all of this was recommended 17 years ago. Why hasn't any of it happened yet? So let me put that question to you. How come this, none of this has happened yet when it was recommended 17 years ago? You know, it, it's one of these things where I wasn't here practicing, you know, at that time, um, but I'm in a hospital that was ravaged by SARS. And uh, and I think, you know, psychologically it allowed where maybe there was, um, I don't know why things weren't done. I think we're now asking those questions as to why those things weren't done. But uh, I, I certainly know that the hospital sector was a real big focus this time around in preparation for the pandemic because we were worried about seeing what we saw in other countries and we thought maybe the problems in long-term care and retirement homes in other countries were because the hospitals were overwhelmed but really you know what we've been caught is flat-footed in terms of that recommendations made in the SARS report by not having staff working across multiple homes um, which you can't control when people are poorly paid not as well paid as people in hospitals and therefore have to work multiple homes but these issues weren't being dealt with we hear about PPE for example that expired um, and that wasn't renewed I don't have those answers what I'm trying to focus on right now with Donna with Charlene is saying you know that we've been working closely with Minister Fullerton and her team giving them the science making sure that they know what we think needs to be done I'm really pleased actually that the premier um, made those announcements with Minister Fullerton yesterday saying these are the things that need to be done because these are things that have been asked for over the past few weeks as the science is basically saying this is what we need to do but now my focus is saving lives and partly that means that we have to be transparent with the data just as Donna said we need to know you know what the PPE supplies are how do we get that to homes you know about the testing but also you know people aren't sharing data on 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 homes that are actually out there in outbreak and when homes and when we don't even know which homes are there how can my hospital actually help local homes when we don't know who's actually at risk so we've been having a lot of these challenges and I don't think anybody's against transparency but when you're in a pandemic there's a lot going on and we need to get 
things in order soon so that we can actually take decisive action and really save as many lives as possible. Too many have been lost already. Hmm. Uh, Charlene, I want to put a picture up right now, or I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Chad Castle, who's directing this, to put the picture up, which apparently is a picture that you tweeted. I'm not sure if it was yesterday or the day before, but it's at the chart, one of the Chartwell care homes, and you know, they're wearing garbage bags. You want to talk about personal protective equipment? They're, they're, they've repurposed garbage bags to double as personal protective equipment. How much of this is going on to the best of your knowledge? Yeah, you know, Steve, every time I look at that picture, I get so emotional. Uh, they're looking at ways to enhance uh, the protection. So uh, they've got the gowns on. And, you know, when I asked, why are you wearing those? They said, to preserve the gowns because they are getting, uh, some are getting two masks per week to wear. Uh, those gowns they wear all day long and we know that this is spread by contact. So it was to protect themselves, those gowns, because they have to wear them all day long. And that is a real clear contrast between, you know, the vulnerable workers doing whatever they can to protect themselves and corporations that have the money to be pulling in PPE and putting it on the front line. And I get calls daily from companies that have got this equipment. So, and uh, you know, the premier, he had a great uh, weekend where he received those and handed them out. People are donating them. In that oh. picture, we were calling on Chartwell, who is valued at over $2 billion, to buy them and put them in and give those workers the proper PPEs that they can change regularly, not wear them all day or wear those surgical masks for a week. Donna, is this representative, that picture of the way things are across the province? I, you know, I think uh, one of the things we've got to look at is, is there's fear at play here. And we do need to make sure that everybody has the appropriate uh, equipment, that they're using the right tools the right way. Uh, certainly these new, these new SWAT teams are really going to help with that. Um, what I would uh, say that, that perhaps others are not aware of is, is certainly our, our larger and, and medium operators across the country are actually in the process of, of, of purchasing PPE, bringing it in, bringing it in for the system for small, small medium and others, those who can't do that. Uh, so that is certainly uh, something that's underway right now while supporting, uh, uh, supporting the, fed, the federal and provincial government in, in getting supplies as well. Uh, I think it's tragic that uh, staff are so fearful that, that they're taking measures that way, but I think it will be uh, more helpful once we get those uh, infection control folks into the homes to help them with their donning and doffing, to make sure that they're wearing it properly, to give them the comfort. But again, it's, uh, these are weapons, so the testing information, uh, certainly getting getting the PPE in uh, and uh, and I and I do know that that large operators are in the process of doing massive uh, trying to trying to procure supplies for the benefit of everybody. Okay, we played a clip earlier from uh, Minister Fullerton and at the same news conference yesterday, Premier Ford uh, also weighed in on this and here's what he had to say about the subject of the day. Roll that clip, please. The system needs to be changed. It will be changed. And uh, with consultation, collaboration with people from long-term care, seniors, residents, and uh, make sure that uh, we, we have higher standards. Uh, keep in mind, 80% of long-term care homes are, are uh, basically privately, privately owned, but they still rely on, on the government. So we have to uh, you know, raise the standards. This is a wake-up call to the world, not just Ontario, right across our country, around the world. And uh, we have to learn best practices of other other uh, regions around the world and adopt them here into into Ontario. Let's pick up on what the premier said. If this is Dr. Sinha a wake up call to this province to adopt best practices from around the world, uh, what are we not doing that we need to be doing going forward? Well, you know, the biggest challenge I've had is, um, you know, I have the privilege of working in a hospital and in my hospital, um, a nurse here actually gets a, a reasonable salary with benefits like sick days, for example, and a pension. But I can't say that any of my nursing colleagues are guaranteed that ability for full-time work with benefits, sick days, and those sorts of things. And that's why we've seen systematically across Canada, it's not just an Ontario thing, we've allowed to build a, a second-class long-term care system where we're not treating the workers the way we deserve, they should be deserved to be treated because this is why 80% of homes in Ontario and across the country were reporting staffing shortages. Because frankly, if you could get a job as a nurse in a hospital, wouldn't you rather do that when it represents job security and more respect? And 
And so when we look at other countries around the world, for example, you know, we have this thing in Canada where when you walk further away from a hospital, if you're working in home care, if you're working in long term care, your salary goes down and your your and, and those supports go down as well. In other countries around the world, they treat all healthcare workers equally. They recognize the importance of equal work, equal pay. And and this is why BC, for example, has come out and said, you know, the government's just gonna make all these employees government employees rushing to give them full-time work salaries. Alberta has now gone ahead and done that during the pandemic. Ontario is now facilitating that after recommending it. Um, and these are some of these systemic changes that might need to occur, that we need to actually treat these homes as if they're hospitals um, and support them better um, because we've really let down. Um, and this is not just an Ontario thing, but across the country, we've built a long-term care system that was designed to fail. Um, and it's struggling right now. And, and my biggest concern at the moment is how many lives can I save when there's about 400,000 across this country that are currently at risk? We've got just a few minutes left here, and I want to make sure Dar both Donna and Charlene get a chance to, to speak of this. Donna, do you know whether your members are going to start paying their employees more after this crisis is over? We have to look at compensation. We have to look at overall funding, quite honestly, and we have to make sure that we're staffed to actually provide the care that our residents need. The, this is not the resident population of 20 years ago. It's not even the resident population of 10 years ago. We're dealing with very uh, frail seniors who have very high needs. We need to make sure that we have the skills and competencies uh, in our homes. And, and we need to look at our, our regulatory and legislative framework as well. Going into this, uh, we, we needed a special order because our legislation would not allow us to implement our pandemic plans. Uh, we need to look at all of these measures on a go-forward basis, uh, a really stern and, and, and real look and be honest with each other as to what we need to do better. But we need, it, we need to do this together. But right now, focus has to be on marshalling the troops, stabilizing the homes today, and getting through the next two weeks. Charlene, unions have been pretty good over the years in getting higher salaries for their people. Um, how come it hasn't happened here? Because of the wage cap. And it was about a year ago, Stephen, that I was brought to a consultation that the government held with us, telling us that they were going to be implement, implementing a wage cap on public sector workers. And we warned them again a year ago. These are the lowest and the poorest paid public sector workers in our province. What do they we typically warned, make? Uh, around 35000 a year if you're working full time. And they make as little as $14. They make more money if they work at Tim Hortons and they get benefits and a full time job. So some of them have said and they're encouraging their children, don't go into this profession. I mean, when you take away uh, paid sick days that was legislated and you put caps on their wages and you don't provide them full-time worker work, this is what you end up with. And it didn't just happen over the last couple of weeks. This has been, I've been fighting this for two decades now. I think this conversation is going to come as a major eye-opener for many people in the province of Ontario who are watching this right now. I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and helping us understand this better. Dr. Samir Sinha, Director of Geriatrics at the Sinai Health System and the UHN in Toronto. Donna Duncan, CEO of the Ontario Long-Term Care Association. Charlene Stewart, President of SEIU Healthcare. Uh, good wishes to all of you going forward and good luck getting through this pandemic. Thanks. Thank you, thank Steve. You, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.